Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar session on an interesting topic, metal halide perovskite exceptional semiconductors for optoelectronic applications. This event is brought to you by NTU Institute of Advanced Studies and the Graduate Student Clubs of Material Science and Engineering and the School of Physical and Mathematical Sciences. My name is Ernest and I'll be your host for today for this webinar. And right with me is Shivam my, as my co-host. So before we begin this seminar, there are some housekeeping rules for all attendees to note. So if you'd like to ask questions during the Q&A session, please use the Q&A features at the bottom of your Zoom screen to post your questions in the webinar. And for those postgraduate students joining us who requires an endorsement of attendance, we we'll appreciate that your name and affiliation is shown uh, in the Zoom, in the Zoom uh, webinar. So for instance, example, like myself, put your name followed by a bracket, be it your school and your affiliation, how this will allow our admin colleagues to keep track of attendance. Additionally, at the end of this session, there will be a feedback session and a form in the QR code. So please scan that and uh, give us a feedback for this session and also indicate whether you need endorsement for your PhD, uh, for those postdoctorate, sorry, for, for postgraduate post students. Meanwhile, today's seminar webinar is organized as part of the Discovery Science Seminar and Interview Initiative. Meanwhile, let us introduce our guest of honor for today. Uh, to the webinar, Prof. Subo Masaka, who is a globally cited researcher by Caravet Analytics. He has more than 88,000 citations in the test of phase 7. Prof. Subo has also received numerous uh, accolades during his academic career. For instance, he is a winner of the NTU Nanyan Award for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. He is also the recipient of the Public Administration Medal, a Silver Medal for the Singapore National Day Award in 2014. Currently, Prof. Subo is also the NTU Associate Vice President for Strategy and Partnership and concurrently also the Executive Director for the Energy Research Institute, also known as IRIAN in NTU. So without further ado, Prof. Subo. Thank okay, you so much, Ernest. It's really a pleasure for me to be here and share, share a few views on where we are headed with, uh, with climate change as well as renewable energy. So there are two parts of the seminar. I'll, I'll, I have maybe five or six slides uh, really setting the stage. And Annalisa will dive into details in terms of uh, uh, the perovskites and other solar cell related topics that we work on. Um, so I think all of you are very much aware that uh, last year uh, th there was an article that was published that spoke about climate change being an unequivocal emergency. Uh, this was a, a article that had more than uh, 11,000 scientists from all over the world. And I just picked three important uh, uh, graphics from that publication. The first thing to note is that the human population will continue to increase. And that is one of the biggest challenges that we have, that we are hosting more and more uh, 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 you know, human activity on earth. That translates directly into the CO2 emissions. And the CO2 emissions uh, that, we, that we are dealing with is also a, a major challenge. As you probably know, we have exceeded 400 parts per million uh, CO2 uh, from the atmospheric perspective. So both of these, uh, really the major effect that, that we, are, uh, we are experiencing is surface temperature change. And the Paris Agreement is very much uh, really dealing towards how do we manage the, the temperature change uh, to below 1.5 degrees centigrade? And to be honest with you, I think we are way past that. Can I have the next slide, please, Annalisa? I think the effects of climate change we are already experiencing. I think in Singapore, all of you will agree that it has been an amazing January with temperatures where you really don't need a fan or air conditioning. Uh, unfortunately, around the world, weather has, has wreaked havoc. I think we've had between, between the, over the last 20 years, more than half of uh, 500,000 people have lost their lives. More and more, I think we are waking up to the fact that what does climate change mean uh, from the perspective of, uh, loss of loss of life, loss of livelihoods, as well as economic impact. And perhaps this is exactly what is needed to spur all of us into action. And it is really the, the presentation that we are gonna share with you addresses how do we tackle the challenges uh, from, a, from a CO2 management perspective uh, going forward. So this chart was put together by EIA and IRENA, 
And what this chart highlights is if we were to really reduce the overall CO2 by 2050, we really need to do three critical things. We first need to put in electrification as shown in the yellow box on the right-hand side. Secondly, we need to put in massive amounts of renewable energy. And lastly, we really need to uh, you know, bring forward measures in terms of energy efficiency. If we can do uh, these three actions, and these three actions would span across buildings, transport, uh, heating and cooling, uh, you know, generation of power, as well as industrial energy efficiency, we really can reach a target where we can, where we can reduce our emissions significantly so as to not completely reverse the effect of climate change, but to begin with, start mitigating the effect of climate change. To go beyond, uh, to reverse the effect of climate change, sorry, go back, please. Yeah, yes. Lisa. To reverse the action of uh, uh, the impact of climate change, we, we have no choice but to introduce actions such as uh, carbon capture, as well as the hydrogen economy. And both of these, uh, in principle, are available. Uh, however, we really need to tackle, tackle these from a techno-economic perspective. I think all is not lost. Uh, we, we are putting together multiple opportunities where more and more renewables will come on stream. And I think Singapore has also announced a target for 2030 where we will have two gigawatts of renewables. You also may be aware that Singapore has announced a 2050 target where we will uh, half our emissions uh, over the next 30 years. And for us to reduce our emissions by 50%, the only chance we have is by carbon capture as well as introducing, introducing hydrogen into the economy. But one of the key aspects as we keep mentioning is renewables. And that is what is seen on the next slide. The next slide really speaks about what is available all over the planet uh, from the perspective of, uh, of, of different forms of energy. And if you click one more time, Annalisa, uh, on an everyday basis, we have more than 4,000 times uh, the amount of uh, energy that we need from solar every single day that can be used by mankind. So the main takeaway message from this is purely if you use solar, we can meet all our needs. Uh, and, and that is really the motivation for some of the things we do. Next slide, please. This chart is also very interesting. This chart highlights uh, how much area is needed to cover all our needs from solar. So for example, if Annelisa could point to any of the boxes, perhaps in the US or perhaps India or Australia, that is, that is the only area needed. And she's pointing on Australia for now. That's the amount of area needed uh, to cover all of Australia's needs by renewable energy. If you take the US, for example, 55,000 square kilometers area is needed to cover entire America's needs by, by, by solar photovoltaics. If you ask the same question of Singapore, what, is, what would be needed for us to cover the, the entire electricity needs of Singapore is 100 square kilometers. Most of you would agree, we don't really have freely available uh, 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer land for deploying solar. But we also have to remember, we can deploy solar in, in, uh, in ocean waters. We can deploy solar in, in reservoirs. So it is not beyond the realm of possibility that we can deploy 100 square kilometers worth of solar to power all of Singapore's needs. Of course, that's, that's difficult to happen. But what I want to share with you is the progress that solar has made uh, over the past few decades. So if you look at the 2010 cost in terms of how much solar costed us, uh, at that point, it was 52 cents per kilowatt hour. Over the past one decade, this has now decreased to in, in by 2020, we are under 10 cents per kilowatt hour. Going forward by 2030, the goal is for five cents per kilowatt hour, and this is residential. I want to highlight that if you take utility solar, which is very large scale solar farms, the cost of solar can be even lower than five cents. So it's really already a, 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 you know, understood that, the, that solar is the lowest cost electricity, which is available today, cheaper than even coal. And how has this been possible? 
this has been possible by really uh, R and D as well as uh, industrial process improvements that have taken place beginning 1954 through 2020. In 1954, we were looking at solar panels that had 6% efficiency. By 2020, the average efficiencies are actually trending more towards 20%. And really the opportunity is that the solar can contribute to more than, solar plus wind can contribute more than 60% in terms of the total electricity generation by 2050. Can you click one more time, please, Annalisa? So let's come back to Singapore's perspective. As you know, what we can deploy solar is only of our rooftops. We can de deploy some amount on reservoirs and so on. But given that we are land constrained, the key challenge that we have is how do we, meet, how do we move solar to higher kilowatt hour per meter square? How do we generate more electricity per square meter is really the challenge that, uh, that, that we are facing. And that is exactly where uh, the rest of the presentation will, will head towards. Uh, how do we use new technologies that can make silicon solar cells more effective, more efficient? And also how do we overall reduce the, the cost of solar cell deployments are some of the techniques or some of the questions that Annalisa will cover. Okay, that's that's all honest I had in terms of my introduction. Yeah, okay, hi. Yeah, just before you leave, actually we have one question. So earlier you mentioned about the solar power in Singapore. So currently in Singapore, uh, there is an intermittency for So how do we actually resolve this moving forward with renewable energies? So uh, as I also mentioned, the target for 2030 that we have mm -hmm. is two gigawatts. And I think I agree with you that one of the main challenges from solar cells or any renewables is intermittency. So to overcome the challenge of intermittency, all renewables need to be paired with batteries. What I didn't really go through today is just like the cost of solar cells have dropped precipitously over the last decade. The same thing is happening through happening to batteries as well. So really the, the target is to bring down the cost of batteries where effectively the cost of solar plus battery storage can be cost effective and compared to the, to the cost of grid, grid scale electricity. And that is uh, pr projected to happen over the next 10 years, just as it is projected to happen that by 2024 or 2025, the cost of electric vehicles would be on par with the cost of internal combustion engine cars. Right, okay, thank you both so okay. for the okay. great insight. Okay, great. Thank you very All much. Right. All right, so before we move on to our next speaker, so our next speaker is actually Dr. Annalisa Bruno, who is currently a senior research scientist coordinating a thermal preparation and tandem solar cell team at Iran. One of her most notable recent research work includes developing scalable perovskite solar cell via thermal classification method with a record power efficiency conversion of 18.1% for uh, those small solar cells module. And this was actually publicized on numerous media platforms, including our own NTU media. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Annalisa to kick start the webinar. Dr. Annalisa, please. Okay, thank you, Ernest. Thank you for the introduction. And I hope you can all hear me well. And I will uh, continue my presentation uh, following the introduction of Prof. Um, of Prof. Subbu. So, as Prost was mentioning before, um, really to make solar real in our everyday life, our challenge is to make it uh, more efficient to really substantially increase the efficiency of the solar of the solar panels, and indeed. Um, this is a classic example of a solar farm, like the one that we have seen before. But uh, in a place like Singapore, and this is our um, our campus in NTU, um, where you can see that all the top roof of our buildings are covered with the silicon panels at the moment, but uh, they are able to generate just um, five, less than 5% of the electricity that we need for our campus to run. So. Uh, these are practical example close to our everyday life, how much we need uh, to improve the efficiency of the solar cells to make it 
um, sustainable in, uh, in everyday life. So at the moment, just to give an idea of the state of the art, when we talk about photovoltaics, um, the technology that is dominating the market is the silicon photovoltaic. So you gather around, ab above 90% of the um, um, of the panel that you see around you, they are uh, made of, uh, of silicon. And silicon can guarantee quite high efficiency, as Prof was, uh, was mentioning before, long-term stability, low price, uh, um, low production costs, so we've seen going uh, substantially down in the last few years. But what is the main limitation? The main limitation is that they are close to the efficiency limit. And then there are some intrinsic limitations uh, related to the structure that we will discuss more in details later. So, so we need to explore other possible uh, um, photovoltaic technology. So for those of you who are not familiar with um, this chart, this is the, um, the, the cell efficiency chart as function of the year uh, that is constantly updated by the NRL, that is the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in the, in, in the States, that it uh, presents like a reference for, um, for the field. So. If we have a look to this uh, to this graph, that is the summary of everything is going on in photovoltaics. We can divide uh, the um, um, the solar cells in. Um, I would say in three main categories. The first one is a multi-junction solar cell, this purple one, where you can see here that they can deliver the highest efficiency, but they have a huge limit. So the they production cost is extremely low. So they are mostly used for um, uh, special application, but they cannot use in everyday life. Then there is the crystalline silicon, that we, the one that we see all around us on our rooftop and is dominating the market. And these this blue curves here with different kind of uh, silicon where you can see that been around over the last 40 years and have uh, quite um, decent efficiency, reaching 27%. Uh, but most of the problem is that the efficiency be stable in the last uh, in the last years, and they basically there is no space for for improvement because they uh, they are very close to the theoretical uh, theoretical limit. So. Let's have a look to with this third category, what is uh, the thin film technologies and emerging PV, especially technology that came out in the last in the last ten years. So let's zoom in this area. What we can see that the technology that guarantee the highest efficiency in the last year. Um, uh, the one based on perovskite, indeed perovskite single juncture reach an efficiency of 25.5% uh, and um, perovskite silicon tandem. That means that it's a, a joint junction, multi-junction from by perovskite and tandem. We exceed 29%, but both these technology, they are still at laboratory level and um, they've been demonstrated over, uh, over large area. So before going to, into detail, how we push the efficiency higher and how we uh, enlarge the area of this, uh, of this device. Let's try to understand why this perovskite solar cell they've been so promising. So first of all, what are these hybrid metal alloy perovskite? So perovskite are material that respond to the general form ABX3 that um, they take their name from, um, from the mineral, which was discovered in the Ural Mountains uh, of Russia at uh, 1839 that it was uh, the name of the mineralogist is uh, Perovsky. So all the material that respond to this structure, they are called perovskite. So this material present a, a band, um, band gap tunability, means that changing the composition of just these, these three elements, we can um, we can obtain different color, both in absorption and in the emission. They have a balanced diffusion length and um, a long diffusion length, much longer than other organic material. And very importantly, they have a process versatility. So th they've been demonstrated they can be produced by very different and low temperature uh, process um, methods. It makes uh, the possibility to have um, cheap semiconductor material that are very also very um, easy process. So so this is the typical tetragonal structure of a 3D, of a 3D perovskite. And let's see um, a really brief story of the perovskite. So the perovskite, the first, um, what is called um, hybrid perovskite, the first synthesis and uh, structural characterization of the perovskite has been realized the, um, at, at the end of the 70s. And the first uh, integration in the different electronics device, uh, but not solar cells yet, they happened in the, in the 90s. 
uh, there was a lot of work done in the IBM laboratories in the, in the states, and they were really showing the um, the um, the good performances of this device. But just in 2009 is where when the first solar cells uh, based on the hybrid perovskite was demonstrated with efficiency just around three uh, percent. And from the first appearance, um, a few years later. It, the, these materials were also used in uh, uh, light emitting diodes, the light emitting transistor, demonstrating also the possibility of uh, be used as um, emitters material. And all in, all the, this year and until now, um, there's been a huge um, research uh, in, in the volume, the volume, both the, the intrinsic the material and the device structure optimization to reach efficiency, as we have seen, exceeding 25% in terms of, um, of single junction and 29% extended. But at the same time, even if today I will not talk about LED much, um, the LED light emitting device have also faced a similar uh, skyrocket increase of their, of their efficiency. So when I talk about material innovation, what do I mean? The beauty of this material that changing the, the composition in terms of cut, um, the cation and highlight composition is, is possible to tune the emission property, the quantum efficiency and, the, and their stability. So they've been during the years many different attempts to um, to change the, the main component of the perovskite by changing um, which um, uh, is delivered with the material with different um, absorption and emission properties and also different uh, stability and different moisture tolerability. Uh, going even more extreme has been possible to demonstrate also quantum dot based on uh, perovskite with a wide uh, tunability of colors and also perovskite that are uh, able to emit um, to emit white light. So also, this slide make clear all the potential that this uh, this material had. But let's go for um, a summary in this sense. So, as um, as we have seen, metal light perovskite has been widely used in the PV application, where I say PV application. So behind the standard um, single junction solar cell, um, also tandem solar cells, flexible device. Uh, BIPV that means building integrated photovoltaics that emits uh, color semi-transparent solar cells and also more exotic hot uh, carrier solar cells. But this is not the only application. So um, my, um, perovskite have been also demonstrated to be good X-ray detectors and scintillators. They've been um, they can also be used in quantum device uh, to as a um, source of uh, quantized light and has been also demonstrated that the ionic property of transport can be used to design uh, neurofork devices that are useful for computing. And last but not least, I was saying the um, light emission application have also been very, very wild, uh, wild, both in LED and in lasing. This is just to give you an idea also how fast has been growing the perovskite LED field. Indeed, what we can see that uh, the organic LED have been in the market in the last 30 years and they are efficiency exceeding 25%. And um, the quantum dot LED also came out at the, the end of 90s, a rich efficiency about 20, but perovskite LED in less than uh, 10 years, um, they are reaching efficiency that um, approaching 20, 20%. Still the limitation for this technology is the stability, but um, this is not maybe the object of my talk today, but if you are interested and uh, on the field, of course, you can get in contact, I will let, let you know more. So let's go back to PV. Our main uh, uh, focus is to maximize the PV utilization. So the three main uh, uh, core aspects that we need, <coughs> sorry. To take, um, to take in account is to reach high efficiency over a large area and uh, to have low production costs. So in our activity in um, NTU, we aim to develop different kind of uh, possible technology to face all these aspects. So what I was mentioning, semi-transparent solar cells, colorful solar cells that can be easily integrated in, uh, in building, uh, flexible device, um, that can be is, uh, instead incorporating many different um, soft uh, uh, surface like uh, your backpack or um, 
or um, uh, any uh, any soft surface. The perovskite tandem, that is the one that will um, guarantee to um, to reach an efficiency that will exceed 30%, and um, also. Uh, even more uh, futuristic to have um, devices that are based completely on perovskite. So to uh, use the band gap to inability of the perovskite to develop uh, perovskite solar cells that can, uh, can reach efficiency uh, above 30% without using of silico. So let's see a little bit more about these tandem solar cells. So as we mentioned before, where we are a single junction, uh, the theoretical limiting efficiency is about 33% for perovskite, while the one of um, uh, of tandem is uh, above 43 percent. But the nice thing is that how does a, a perovskite work? So this is a typical silicon solar cells that is a very uh, very efficient in absorbing the the red light, but it's not very efficient to absorb the the blue light. So most of the um, uh, of the radiation is uh, is lost in form of it. So if we put on top of it a blue absorbing um, uh, material, this can compensate for the this um, uh, the, the blue region and uh, um, this radiation is not be lost. So using the two cells in combination, um, this uh, these are the, a theoretical prediction that um, that show that with the proper tuning of the both the, the top and the bottom um, band gap of the of the of the cells, we can reach efficiency above forty three percent. And this um, is a summary of the. Um, on the recent result, where you can see that silicon, as I mentioned before, is around 26%, while the silicon limit is uh, 29, theoretically, practically, uh, is uh, 27%, so we are really very close. The perovskite reached 25.5. And uh, very nicely, uh, both perovskite and silicon, uh, both in the two terminal and four terminal configuration, are increasing very fast in the last, uh, have been increasing very fast in the last six years. Um, so, of course, this is very, all very beautiful, but we have um, a critical um, challenge to, to face in, in order to make these cells efficient. The first of all, as I mentioned before, what I call the spectral overlap. So we need to properly tune the band gap of the perovskite to make sure that, um, uh, that we get in that region that give us the maximum efficiency. So even tuning the color of the perovskite, we need to be sure that uh, the efficiency is always high. And at the same time, the, the, our top perovskite solar cell need to be also highly transparent because part of the radiation, the red radiation needs to go to the silicon uh, sites to be, uh, to be improved. And then, of course, we need to scale up our technology because as we have seen in the first slide that I presented, one of the first slides that I presented, all this technology has been demonstrated over a uh, over small area. So, as I mentioned before, the, the, the two configuration for tandem can be a four terminal and two terminal configuration, which um, it basically means that in the four terminal, um, the two cells are electrically separated and uh, there is a gap between the cells and either they constitute uh, one, um, one cells independently. The two configuration, there have been a lot of discuss in the literature which one is better, but they have both, they have pro and in one case, uh, for the fourth terminal, you have the two process of the two cells that they can be processed independently. But on the other hand, you need extra electronic and extra absorbing layer. While um, the two terminal device can um, achieve uh, higher theoretical e uh, efficiency and in principle, it can be integrated with a proper um, process in the silicon production line. But of course, there are more um, challenging in terms of integration and current matching. So at the moment um, in, in Arian, we are studying both the configuration and we are working on both of them to maximize um, the efficiency of both in a different, uh, different configuration. I will just quickly show you some of our recent results with the four terminal uh, configuration. So basically we have a silicon solar cells on the bottom and a perovskite solar cells on top, where you can see that um, this is the, the JB curve for the, for the, for the two cells. Um, and this is the, the spectral um, distribution where you can see that the light is absorbed in this region from the uh, from the perovskite and this other region from uh, from the silicon so you can see clearly what is that the two 
um, as we expected, the two technology are um, very nicely uh, compatible. And in this configuration, we achieve an efficiency that is about um, um, 26 percent, but even if we analyze these cells with a lower solar concentration that it corresponds to um, a day where we have um, when we have clouds or um, uh, or the sun uh, not um, not at its maximum, the efficiency of the cell can reach even 20, 27%. And this is a very nice result because he, he guarantees us that even in real uh, time application um, configuration, these um, four, uh, 40 tandem solar cells, they can work properly. So the other challenge that we were mentioning that all these perovskite and also this tandem, also the one that I have seen uh, you show you before, this one that we can reach 27%, we are talking about efficiency that are, um, uh, we are talking about size uh, smaller than one centimeter square. But in real life, we do need large area, right? If you want to put on uh, on our rooftop, if we want to integrate in our window, whatever application we need to think of, we need to push the higher efficiency and higher the, the side. So in around the world, there have been um, uh, many different attempts to reach um, um, large area devices, both by spin coating, by printing. So this is a slow die, but um, there are also different um, different approach of um, based on the solution uh, and the inks um, uh, based on um, perovskite and, uh, uh, and vacuum process. In particular, um, I will pre um, in in Arian we are working on uh, on the three of them. I will show to you some of our recent results on the. Um, based on the slow die, but most of the work on the um, on the hybrid and um, um, and the vacuum process uh, perovskite, and we'll show you why we think that this approach is very um, is very promising for the future application. So this is um, a way of uh, printing the perovskite. That is um, a screen printing approach, and uh, as you can see here, this is um, a thirty by thirty module where um, the different layer are. Um, printed one after the other. The process is uh, print is uh, um, schematized here, and in this case, also the top electrode, the carbon electrode, is printed before the perovskite is infiltrated inside. Um, so this is an example of the um, of a 30 by 30 modules that you can see here, and these modules are very promising in terms of stability because they've demonstrated over two years stability in a even in an in ambient as humid as Singapore. This is due to the good uh, properties of the carbon layer um, to be really um, hydrophobic. But the, the main limitation is, is with technique, we cannot achieve efficiency above uh, 13%. And as you can see, these cells are not fully fully transparent. So they can, um, uh, they, of course, they can have some utility, but for other utilities, they will not be, um, they will not be, um, the, their application is uh, limited. Another approach that we are also working in is going to in the with slow die, where you can see here. Uh, sorry for the noise. Um, that also over uh, over large area. This is a typical 10 by 10 module. The perovskite has been uh, printed, and also in this configuration, you can see that very homogeneous and also semi-transparent modules can be um, can be developed and the. Uh, the, the process is very is very fast, and this is some example of the cells that we have developed in uh, in areas. So where you can see these are cells with different colors. This is for conventional utility. This is semi-transparent, even if the lighting is not uh, very promising in this case. And this is um, uh, built on um, flexible devices. And um, this is a very nice done with um, the screen printing method that I was showing you before, where you can design um, your path. Uh, and you can create um, different uh, um, different patterns of uh, of, uh, of cells. So you can alternate um, uh, a cells with uh, a transparent transparent light. But let's go to the um, um, to the last part of my uh, of my presentation, where I show you all the potential and all the um, effort that we have. Um, 
we done in the last few years regarding vacuum deposit perovskite solar cell. So um, um, the vacuum deposition is a well-established industrial technique. Just to give you an idea, all the OLEDs that you have on your telephone or your screen, they are all uh, prepared by um, uh, by vacuum process by thermal evaporation. So in the semicon industry is one of the most widely used. Why is widely used? Because it can guarantee um, high quality film with low roughness, high purity, a uniformity over over large area. This is a typical example of a chamber where uh, multi-material can be uh, co-evaporated at the same time. Um, it's a solvent-free process and is intrinsically additive, so it means that you can evaporate one layer after, after the other without interference with the one below, which is very um, very promising for many applications. And a very important um, aspect is also that it's a surface conformational. It means that it can, it can be deposited also on rough surface, like the one that you see on top, that is the typical um, surface of uh, silicon solar cells. So this is um, the most promising approach to develop um, perovskite on tandem solar cells, where the silicon solar cells is a rough surface. And also this is, um, is very, very promising also for for developing flexible devices. As you can see in the picture here, you will see also some rear one. So what has been our approach uh, in the last few years to, um, to develop the cells based on the vacuum process and to bring them towards uh, towards large area. So the first um, the first idea that we have developed two kind of um, of uh, configuration because they can have different kind of uh, of application and to go from the small area to the large area we have been working on the active material so engineering the active material which means uh, changing the composition and the stoichiometry of the perovskite to make it um, the most uh, uh, the most of the to maximize the light absorption, um, improving the interfacial uh, optimization of the interlayer, doing some surface treatment to improve the quality of the film, and light management. Since our solar cells, as you can see, here, is a multi-layer device, so we need to make sure that um, uh, that there is no loss of light through the device. When uh, we have optimized the device over a small area, we apply a um, um, a device design that allow us to bring our cells to, from small solar cells to large area to large area modules. So without going too much into detail, you can see here that basically this is a process of co-evaporation. So we have changed the stoichiometry of our material by changing the, the temperature of evaporation of uh, the material. This guarantees um, a condition changing this temperature that gives the highest performance of our cells. Well, then we have work on the interfacial optimization that means changing the interlayers among the cells to decrease the, the stereosis. If you're not familiar, this is the scan of the cells in one direction and then in the forward direction. In a good cell, we expect it to, to be um, almost overlap. And then we have uh, performed some surface threat treatment based on uh, potassium and potassium acetate to maximize the, um, the lifetime of the material and also to make sure that the, the grain size, this is a cross section of our solar cells, the grain size um, are enlarged as we can see here and um, the potassium DP penetrate along to all the thickness. This is the thickness of the device. You can see that the, the, um, the potassium is almost stable along the device. So, this um, combined approach based both on the chemistry and engineering approach of every single device, uh, single layers of our cell, allow us to develop um, a cell with the uh, efficiency ranging from um, um, from 19 to exceeding uh, 20 percent. So. Um, this shows the efficiency of this method that really step-by-step um, um, -step process combine all the, um, all the interlayers of, uh, of the cells can, can bring to, to high efficiency solar cells. So with a similar approach, I just show you for up to now for the NAP device, with a similar approach we, device, we develop for PIN device, that it means a device where the current flows in the other direction, we achieve uh, efficiency that are uh, consistent, consistently exceeding 20%, which means that the um, that in terms of thermally evaporated perovskite, this is all result that you have in the world. You can see that the stars here are the results from our group. So in terms of small area devices, we are among the highest 
uh, ever reported um, thermal evaporated perovskite solar cells. And also as a proof of concept, we demonstrate that this technique is very versatile and we also demonstrate a flexible device with efficiency about 90%. And this is how the efficiency is maintained uh, the more you bend your cells. Because of course, if you have a flexible solar cell, you want it to be bended. And uh, this is quite good. Um, um, resistance of the cells for 1,000 uh, 1, bending. Okay, so up to now we have shown that we are able to develop uh, small area devices uh, that are comparable with the state of the art uh, for thermal evaporated perovskite. And um, but the real challenge, if we want to bring this um, this perovskite really to the market, is to bring this device towards a large area. Um, so what, what has been our strategy? What is the result that we have obtained to bring this uh, device in the small area? So this is the first device that you have seen, the one that I show you the optimization. So we are talking about a typical area uh, of about um, 0 0.16 centimeter square. When we scale up to one centimeter square and four centimeter square, what we can see is that um, if you have a look to this uh, curve, uh, to this uh, graph, even if you are not familiar with solar cells, the information that you need to know that is um, this is a current as function of voltage. So uh, when you are at voltage zero, you see the current that is flowing in the cells. So basically you can see that if you compare um, the small area cells and increasing the area, this value of the current does not decrease. Also, what you can see that is the voltage, when you scan the voltage, um, the voltage at open circuit, the, um, that is when there is no current in the device, also does not decrease, increasing, increasing the size is stable. So this means that the cells, the quality of the, um, the quality of the perovskite uh, the perovskite that we have in the old cell is uh, is good. We lose you observe here that is a loss in efficiency. This is basically due to the decrease of this point here that is correspond to the to the field factor, the curve. Um, decrease differently. And the uh, decrease of the, um, of the shield factor is related to the sheet resistant of the, um, uh, of the TCO, so the, um, the transmittent co uh, conductive uh, oxide that you have as base of the, um, uh, of the solar cell. So it's the substrate where you build your, uh, your, perovskite, your perovskite solar cells on. So this is something that it cannot be changed but it can be improved in a way. So this effect that I show you here very clear, it can be observed even more clearly when we further increase the device. Uh, the device. So you can see that if you compare one centimeter square with four centimeters square, six, 0.5 centimeters square, you can still see that the quality of the perovskite cells is good, but still this uh, field factor is, uh, is decreasing. So the way to overcome this problem is to redesign the geometry of the cells. So what do we think we thought of doing? Instead of having a square device, we have a rectangular device. Where, um, so we first the first trial, we fixed the, um, the the length and we change the width of the of the device. So you can also already see that it's in rectangular uh, shape with even with a si similar um, with a similar um, area. Um, the losses on um, on the on the field factor are, are much reduced. So this is even more promising if we do the other way around. We we fix the um, um, the width of the cells to a value that is. Uh, uh, that gives us uh, small losses on the on the field factor, and we just change the length of the device. So we are able, in a rectangular shape, to obtain cells that have no losses when we uh, when we scale them up. So this is the base that allow us to design uh, mini modules. So mini modules is a, a connection of uh, solar cells. Um, of solar cells, um, one after the other. So they are series connected. And this is an example. So you have um, a series connected uh, connected solar cells. But in reality, what um, what um, what you do? So you have subcells of rectangular shapes that is allowed to lower the resistance of your um, of your background. It's FTO, and um, the mini modules, of course, are series connected to reduce the power loss. So. Um, 
when you deposit your perovskite, you need to to separate your cells and to to make some um, um, what we call P1, P2, and P3. So some separation along your uh, your devices to have a series of independent cells, but they they, they are still interconnected. How you design the division of the cells is very important to achieve. I, I efficiency. So we also did a modeling and we showed that the more this distance is bigger, so the one from P1 to P3, the different the, um, the subcells which should be. So um, in, uh, in our first attempt, we did both a laser and manual uh, design of our, of our module that it correspond a very large, what we call this, this that area, that is means this, uh, this distance. And in this case, the best, the, um, the solar cells, um, the solar subcell that gives the best efficiency correspond to one centimeter square. So in this configuration, we managed to have um, a mini modules of 21 centimeters square that, as you can see here, is made of a connection of, um, of six subcells. Uh, we reach an efficiency of 18.13%. So this has been the highest uh, demonstrated uh, perovskite mini modules um, by, by any technique. And of course, it was the first demonstrated by, uh, thermal, uh, by thermal evaporation. So this one is not be the only one. We have demonstrated different uh, kind of uh, mini modules ranging from 14 centimeters square to 42 centimeters square with the efficiency constantly above 16%. What is the limitation of these modules? As you can see here, I use this expression, GFF. What is GFF? It's geometrical field factor. The geometrical field factor, it means practically how much of the area is covered. So in this case, we cover all among all the area, um, just between 72 and 75 centimeters. This is because we lose a lot in terms of, um, um, in terms of dead area and distance between the cells. So our next step has been to minimize all the dead area. And this has been possible by doing um, the, um, the etching between the cells using a laser instead of doing manually. As, as you can see in this scale, the distance between P1, P2 and P3 that uh, was designed before is much smaller. In this case, we realize many modules that as you can see, the subcells are much packed, much more packed. Of course, we redesigned the size of the subcell that we use. And um, uh, in this case, we, we obtain a geometrical field factor, a coverage of our module about 72%, uh, 92%, that is, uh, that is much higher. Also in this case, this, uh, there was, um, uh, there was a, another record that we, uh, we achieved with this, uh, with this configuration and it's been uh, highlighted in the news as well. Um, going forward towards uh, the stability, because if we want to go towards um, commercialization, of course, the first thing that we want is that this device can, needs to be stable because we don't want to go and change them uh, continuously. So we, we have shown that our, with our way of growing uh, the perovskite, that is a solvent-free solvent -free approach, we can guarantee for uh, uh, for these cells, a very long uh, stability. This is for an encapsulated device, even uh, under continuous illumination, and um, in both the configuration that we have uh, we have demonstrated, and very nice. Um, when this storage uh, with this uh, sample are stored at um, ambient um, condition and just measured from one to that, they have show of from time to time, so they are not continuously illuminated. Uh, they have shown that a very good stability maintaining 90%, over 90% of their stability for over one and a half year. So this is extremely promising for, um, for commercialization. Another aspect that also we investigated is the thermal stability. Because as you can imagine, when a solar cell um, is under the sun, is um, the internal temperature can rise significantly. And also, uh, so it's usually estimated they can reach at least 85 degrees. So we study the thermal stability of these devices at 85 degrees, showing that um, also in this case, these devices constructed, constructed by thermal evaporation can guarantee a very high, um, very long-term stability. This is uh, uh, 3,000, 
36 hundred hours, it means over five months of continuous baking at uh, 85 degree. Okay, so um, as, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, this is all very beautiful and uh, it's very interesting and promising, but um, our vision in long term is, um, uh, of course, to develop solar cells that they can be really integrated in our everyday life. To make it possible, we also developed uh, color semi-transparent solar cells uh, that uh, with the idea that they could be integrated in a building like the one that you see here or over a bridge or many different um, urban contexts. Because this is a way to, um, um, to exploit the land, even in urban contexts where usually you don't have the space to, um, to have a solar farm. And so making these cells transparent and making them cell uh, color, they can be uh, aesthetical appealing uh, architectonical elements that can make them easier to be, to be integrated. So um, this is the, the, the device structure that you have seen before. What we have done, we have changed our top electrode with a different uh, top electrode that is semi-transparent because our previous one was based on gold, so it was not transparent. And we have ticked the, um, the thickness of the of this interlayer. And we can see that changing from 115 to 200 nanometers, we change basically the reflect, uh, reflectance of these cells and we can develop cells of very bright different color. So these cells, this is a CA distribution of these cells, um, um, white different colors and the beautiful thing is that they can maintain also very nice um, high efficiency consistently for all the different, uh, for the different colors. And we also, um, with the same schedule that we have discussed before, we also have developed semi-transparent uh, semi uh, MIDI modules. So what I have shown you that actually thermal evaporation is a promising route to bring perovskite through commercialization as it can guarantee a very long stability, um, both in um, ambient condition and when um, aged in um, at high temperature. And also we have shown the, that by thermal evaporation is possible to scale our our solar cells. So this is our recent result that um, this is the, all uh, the efficiency of the modules for an active with active area above 10 centimeters square, what we usually call uh, mini modules. And uh, this value is uh, is the highest ever reported. Well, what is the what makes this um, technique very promising is that even if at the moment we have an efficiency that is about 20% on small area device, while I have shown you that by solution process we can reach 25%. Uh, the losses that we have when we scale up our devices are, are, are minimal. So this make it, uh, this technique very promising for um, um, uh, for large area, for large area application and high efficiency in conjunction with the, with silicon. So this is a uh, thermal knowledge and this is the, um, the tandem team where it's been developed most of the last part of the work that I have presented. And uh, of course, all this work has been done in, uh, in Arian. Uh, that is the Energy Research Institute of NTU that uh, Prof Subo is the, um, um, uh, is the executive director and uh, the perovskite group is, um, is a, a very big group but also many other PIs are involved in the in the development of the of the perovskite activity and um, I think I'm ready for your questions all right okay Dr. Nisa, thank you very much for the wonderful webinar well I think most of us have learned quite a lot about perovskite solar cells <laughs> yeah okay so without further ado I'll hand it over now to Shibam who will head over the Q&A session so Shibam okay. please Thank you, Ernest, and thank you, Dr. Annalisa, for such an insightful talk. Uh, now the talk is open for Q&A session. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen to post your questions. But before taking the questions from audience, we do have a couple of questions regarding science discovery. So our first question is, given the emphasis of circular economy, is there a viable option on recycling perovskite solar cells while keeping the PCI for them very high. Okay, yes, the answer is yes. So there's been a few works that have been demonstrated. Let me see. Yes, um, that uh, 
uh, actually perovskite solar cells can be um, uh, recycled. And, um, and the most interesting part is that, um, so from this study, that it, it was quite at the beginning of the, when the perovskite came out around 2016, it was the first study that was showing something like this, is that if we assume that the perovskite is um, $1 per square meter, most of the of the cost, it comes from the FTO substrate. That is the, the substrate where the the perovskite solar cells is uh, is built on so the the uh, the um, the conductive um, the transparent con uh, conductive oxide and this is very um, uh, this is this is quite expensive and in this work they've shown that through a very simple process that is also the way where we separated it um, it's possible to further reuse this uh, this FTO substrate quite a few times without no losing almost anything in the efficiency. Very nicely, it's also possible to recycle some of the component. So in this case, it's a PBI2 because uh, this perovskite was a methyl ammonium lead iodide uh, MAI PBI2. So some of the element, the PBI2, is um, is being recycled and. Um, making two cells around three times using the same material, the efficiency also in this case uh, is just a very minimal, uh, minimal drop. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so even after that, uh, there have been uh, some other study that have also show that it's possible also to reuse the, um, um, uh, to, cleave up the, the gold that is also a cost, uh, is a consistent cost of the cells and to, to reuse, to redissolve it, to reuse the gold again. Thank you. Our next question is, will machine learning be used to investigate new combination of new materials like dopants to increase the stability and lifetime of perovskite solar cells? This is absolutely yes. So this has been uh, optic uh, uh, out, uh, outfield, and uh, there have been already quite a few studies to do material prediction in this sense, and also um, um, for. Um, not, not just for the stability intrinsic of the material, but also for the stability of and the performance when integrated in device. Because as I mentioned before at the beginning, so the, the perovskite are, uh, are material that are based on uh, basically three elements. Three in the easiest case, but mostly um, uh, they can have even more. So the best working combination include multi-cation and multi-allied material. So the combination can in principle be infinity. So there have been already a big screening of, um, of the materials, but uh, machine learning is absolutely, um, has been um, many attempts, let's say, to, to, to do input with the optical, electrical characteristics to really develop a um, big program on the machine learning has been active. Also, I mean, also in Singapore, Singapore has been uh, quite a pioneer in that. Uh, thank you. So now let's take the questions from the audience. Attendees can post their questions in Q&A. Uh, tab of at the bottom of their Zoom screen. Mm -hmm. So we do have some questions. So the first question is from Nitin Shivaraman. He wants to ask, do you believe that there is a higher potential of carbon emission reduction using biomass residues in Asian countries uh, as compared to solar? Because Asian countries have usually large agricultural residues. Um, I, I can think that, I mean, the two of them can go, can go together, but I don't think that uh, a biomass uh, can, be, can be really competing at that stage. But uh, I can see a potential, I mean, it cannot be the only one, so neither of the two can, can, be, uh, can be alone. Okay, uh, so the next question is from Yujia Tian. Mm -hmm. uh, this person wants to ask uh, that, what is your opinion about portable solar devices? What do you think are the potentials of these perovskite solar cells in such devices? Okay, so uh, perovskite solar cells will be just perfect as portable device because they can be really lightweight, really thin, and um, 
they have potential to to adapt in uh, different conditions. So they don't, for example, one of the uh, main difference with silicon is that silicon works very well with a strong sun, but in low uh, illumination, it doesn't perform as well as perovskite do. So um, the beauty of perovskite can be also that they can be uh, can be can be light, can be on flexible device. As I am demonstrating, and they can also um, work nicely with the indoor illumination. The real problem now that even if the content is is very small, there is still lead. So to make it portable, there's something that you bring in your pocket or next to your snack. Uh, the encapsulation must be uh, really uh, really trustable, and there should be uh, external layer. So I can see mostly this like the the limit, even if the content is uh, is very is very small. Uh, there is one paper that I've shown here that, I mean, if we consider in terms of modules, this, the, the content of, uh, of lead in a um, PB absorber is much less than uh, the, the lead content that you have in a, uh, in a silicon module, in the solder of the silicon module. But still, uh, for portable device, this could be significant. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mohammed. Omar would uh, like to know the effect of the TCO sheet resistance on fill factor, and why would the different geometry have a such uh, have such a profound effect on it? Um, okay, so basically, um, uh, the uh, the sheet resistance. So the um, how can I say? Um, so the, the TCO basically is very good in conducting in, 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 uh, in the, the vertical direction. That is the, the direction of the illuminance and also is where the, the charge are extracted. Um, but on the horizontal, uh, uh, on the horizontal, um, um, on the horizontal direction is less, is less efficient. So a design, um, a proper design that minimizes one of the direction can uh, uh, can enforce the extraction of the charge in the direction that, that you prefer. So uh, the next question by Christian Clark is uh, he wants to know more about the composition of perovskite films with different color. Okay, so I think I have I have shown quite a few different colors and. Um, so we can go step by step because uh, let me go back. One thing that I want to clarify is that um, at the beginning of the talk, I have shown you that basically you can change a light, you can change. Um, let me go back. Just to make it clear. So what we have seen here that basically maybe one, let's do like uh, even even here it's even easier. Okay, so what you can see here is basically so here we are changing the composition, and we can see a clear um, a clear um, change in absorption and in PL, maybe for example, just changing, keeping everything constant and changing the chloride, changing the content of bromide or the, change, or the content of iodine. The change of one of these can give this shift. But also if you keep the iodine, for example, cost, constant in this configuration in your X and you just change the organic compound, it can also bring to um, a, a change of colors in the perovskite. So when you change the ratio between um, the, uh, when you change either the iodine content or the, uh, or, uh, the cation content in this part, you can, uh, you can change the composition. There are some changes that are more efficient there than others. Um, for example, chloride and iodide substitution uh, is usually the, the fastest way to, to, change it, um, to change the color, but it's not the only way. Because mostly when you change the, 
when you change the, the cation instead, what you actually change, you change the distance between these interlayers. Changing the, 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 this is the cation, changing the distance between these interlayers is also another way to change the colors. And this is an intrinsic property. On the other hand, the, the, the solar cells with bright different color that I show you at the end, that one were obtained just in a reflective mode. In that case, we did not change anything about, um, uh, we did not change anything about the, uh, the, the content of the, of the perovskite, but we just changed it the, let me, we just changed the, um, the top layer of our cells and this changed the reflective index. Yeah. In this case here. In this case, we the perovskite content is the same. So we change this top electrode and we change this thickness. This thickness, basically it changed the reflectance on, on these cells. And as you can see, as we tune the, the, um, the thickness of this layer, we change the peak of the, of the reflection spectra. In this case, we generate um, cells that in reflecting mode, they give different colors. But in this case, the perovskite has not been changed. Um, I want to just to make clear that uh, we're two different things. Sure. Okay. So uh, the next question is from Yo Bunte. Mm -hmm. He wants to ask, what is your view on lead-free perovskites, such as tin-based halide perovskites? Um, okay, so tin-based perovskite, it will be, um, they are very important and I'm sure that they will, uh, they will come through. The already the, um, uh, the development that we have observed in the last one and a half year have been amazing. There is a, um, a huge problem with stability with these devices. So I can see a huge potential, but the stability is the main issue that needs to be tackled. Okay. So uh, I would I also like to ask a question. How, yeah. how soon would perovskite solar cells be widely used in commercial applications? So when can we see them? Uh, uh, um, I don't think it's gonna, we need to, to wait too long. I will say in the next five years, we will see in the market. Okay. <laughs> for some application, not uh, not maybe mainstream, but for some application. Thank you. So uh, we can have a few more questions. Uh, so attendees can please post their questions under the Q and A tab. So is it? Uh, I guess we have taken. Uh, okay. So there is uh, one more question from Christian Clock. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the electronic band gap of perovskite used uh, in your mini cells? It's about uh, 1.6 eV. Okay. Uh, any more questions mm. from the audience? We can wait for a couple of mm. minutes and just to give an idea, the typical uh, silicon solar cells is one point. Uh, it's one one point two. So we have a wider band gap. That's why we are. Um, uh, uh, we we can in principle absorb more light, more efficient light. So if there are no more questions, uh, mm -hmm. let us thank Dr. Annalisa for such mm -hmm. an insightful mm -hmm. and wonderful talk. And uh, for those postgraduate students who require the endorsement for their attendance, mm -hmm. uh, we'll really appreciate uh, that. Please put your name and affiliation as uh, in the given format, as uh, you can see in my name or Ernest's name. Uh, it will help our admin colleagues to keep track of your attendance. So also, uh, we would like to hear your feedback about uh, our webinar. So please scan the uh, feedback uh, QR code, uh, which will be shown shortly on the screen. So please uh, uh, fill the feedback form and give your valuable feedback for, uh, to us. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Dr. Anissa. Bye bye. Okay, bye. Thank you, Dr. Anissa. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, thanks, bye. bye.